Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Isham, and I would like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. Today's speakers, Robert Dudley and Glenn Hodgkins, will be presenting historical trends in summer precipitation, base flows, and storm flows in New England, and projections of seasonal stream flow for coastal streams in Maine. I am joined by Emily Fort, Data and Information Coordinator for the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston. Emily, would you please introduce our speakers and welcome. Thanks, Ashley. I'd be happy to. Um, welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you joining us today. So I'm going to run through the introductions and then we'll get started. Rob Dudley is a hydrologist with the USGS New England Water Science Center main office. Rob has been with the USGS since 1992, where he's been involved with a variety of hydrologic, hydraulic, and statistical modeling studies. His ongoing and recent work involves investigation of long-term groundwater trends in northern New England and the National Glacial Aquifer System, and the development of a National Streamflow Climate Change Indicators in cooperation with the U.S. EPA. Glenn Hodgkins is also a hydrologist with the USGS New England Water Science Center main office. Glenn has been working as a hydrologist with the USGS since 1990. Much of his recent research has focused on historical trends and water-related variables such as river flows, river ice, lake ice, and snowpack, and on their relation with climatic variables. He is the lead author or co-author on 37 journal articles and USGS publications in this area since 2002, focusing on changes at the regional to the international scale. Other areas of research include river flooding and bridge scour. So, Rob and Glenn, we really appreciate you being with us today, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Uh, this is Rob speaking, and Glenn and I will be sharing the presentation, but uh, I'll be starting things off. All right. Our talk this afternoon comprises three parts, and we'll begin with a quick background of documented historical climate-related trends in New England, and it's these observed trends that have provided the impetus for us to pursue the NCC WSC-funded work where we investigated historical trends in base flows and storm flows in New England, and we pursued watershed modeling to estimate future hydrologic conditions for coastal streams in Maine uh, under a range of climate change scenarios. So first, we'll look at a very brief summary of hydrologic trends that have been, been documented in New England. And uh, the investigations I'm going to mention here in this introductory part, it's necessarily uh, going to be brief and it, it's not going to be complete. Uh, I want to urge you to all the uh, publications that will be mentioned in this talk are located uh, links at this uh, web page, the main waterusgs.gov page slash publication slash climate. And I'd urge you to, to look into that for more details of everything that we're talking about today. So among the uh, consistent changes that we've documented, the most notable have occurred during the winter and spring and include decreases in duration and thickness of ice, denser or thinner snowpack, and earlier snowmelt runoff. First, an example of observed decreases in duration of lake ice. Specifically, lake ice out dates measure the last day of the presence of ice on a lake. And what makes this an interesting data set to look at is that the lake ice out dates have been recorded for a relatively long period of time, largely for recreational or economical purposes like navigation. So lake ice out is typically a notable event and fairly easily agreed upon when it happens. The map of the left shows locations are 28 lakes for which we've examined these data. Five of them have more than 160 years of data, and 19 of them have more than 100 years of data. So let's look at ice out dates for Dam Riscata and Moosehead Lakes. Both have well over 150 years of record, and what's immediately apparent is the amount of variability in the lake ice out dates. We have Julian date 
on the y-axis is a measure of that lake ice out date, years across the bottom. Um, the spread's around 20 days there in the variability. And drawing a stiff moving average low S curve through these data illustrate the long-term variation in the central tendency of the data. You can see recent ice, ice out dates are earlier than in the 1800s, and the trends are nonlinear with multi-decadal components. And if we examine them in groups from north to south with uh, red in the north and gray in the south, the lake ice out trends through 2008 on this plot show a fair amount of coherence. Of note is the cold period in the 1960s during which we had a lot of snow records set in the region. And note also that the trends toward earlier ice out dates in the most recent 50 years have a median of almost two days per decade and it's not representative of changes during the most recent 75 to 125 years, which averages closer to about half a day per decade for a trend. And we've had a mix of later and earlier dates in the last 25 years. So as a part of working up stream flow records, USGS hydrologists routinely document days during which the gauging of stream flow is affected by ice. So looking at trends, and the presence of ice in rivers shows consistent evidence of warmer winters in New England. Again, this is a low S, uh, plot of low S curves, the nine longest record rivers in New England for which we are able to pull together these ice-affected flow data. The left axis indicating the number of days of ice-affected flows. Again, years along the bottom. The heavy green curve and the data points are the nine river average. And the figure consistently and clearly illustrates fewer days of ice-affected flows over time with an average decrease of 20 days, or about 18% from 1936 to 2000, and the last days of affected ice in the spring being about 11 days earlier. This is consistent with findings of trends in the characteristics of snowpack, in which we've seen a decrease in snow depth or increase in snow density at 18 of 23 snow course sites in Maine. The plot on the right is a time series of a four-site average of snow density measured at the longest record snow sites in western Maine, northern New Hampshire, on or near March 1st. Another low S curve drawn through the data illustrate a trend toward denser snowpack, that is, a snowpack that is riper, closer to melt conditions for the same time of year. The photo at the left is taken in May 1963, which was a record year for snowpack. This is a satellite image of New England after an early winter snowstorm. The role of snow in the hydrology of New England is an important one. The water delivered in the form of snow and stored in snowpack over the winter can make a substantial portion of the total stream flow that flows through New England streams every year. So the timing and quantity of water delivered by a melting winter snowpack is not only ecologically important, but it's important from hazards and water availability standpoints. And most of the flooding that occurs in New England has a significant snowmelt component. The timing and amount of snowmelt is also critical for proper reservoir operations, power generation, drinking, and agriculture. So in an effort to measure how timing of snowpack accumulates and melts in New England streams, we've used a metric we refer to as the winter-spring center volume date. That is the date by which half the total volume of stream flow from January 1st to May 31st has flowed past a river gauging station. So let me illustrate what I'm talking about by looking at a spring hydrograph of the St. John River in northern Maine. St. John's been gauged at this location since 1926. The river at this spot delineates the main Canadian border. This particular river basin gets over a third of its precipitation in the form of snow. So here's an example of an average hydrograph for the St. John River from January 1st to May 31st along the bottom axis. Log scale for stream flow is on the left. The red line represents average stream flow for 84 years of record. Though precipitation is relatively evenly distributed throughout the season, early in the season it falls as snow and is stored as snowpack, so that later in the season when the snow melts, 
the hydrograph rises, and that's what you see here in this graph. The blue lines indicate the range of historical flows with the uh, interquartile range and the mi minimums and maximums observed for every day during that time period. The average historical center of volume date, where half the runoff occurs on each side of the state, was April 28th. Now, in 2010, it was an early snowmelt year, which relative to the 84-year average was over two weeks early. That, in turn, resulted in record high flows for early April and record low flows for the end of May of that year. This demonstrates it's not only important to uh, measure the quantity of stream flow, but the timing as well. It's important to note that the total amount of runoff in the 2010 season wasn't anything abnormal, it was just simply the timing in which it ran off. So here's an example, low S curve drawn, drawn through uh, center volume dates for this Piscataquis River in Maine. Again, dates are on the left axis and years along the bottom, clearly illustrating spring runoff advance over time. And here, a set of low S curves for the 13 longest record rivers in New England with minimal human disturbance illustrate coherent trends in snowmelt runoff timing from northern to southern New England. Overall, timing has changed one to two weeks earlier. And this is a consistent observation across eastern North America. There's a large annual snowpack. That is approximately where about a third of annual precipitation falls and accumulates in snow. And so we can see a shift in the spring hydrograph. If we look at this generalized spring hydrograph with months across the bottom, stream flow along the left axis, the earlier hydrograph results in increasing flows in winter months, lower flows for spring months, which is indeed what's been documented when we examine trends in monthly flows. Much of these winter-spring changes have correlated strongly with winter-spring air temperatures. Given the clear changes in winter-spring hydrology in New England, we hypothesize that earlier snowmelt runoff might, in turn, affect summer flows. Specifically because groundwater is recharged in spring largely by snowmelt, we wondered how historical winter-spring changes might be affecting summer low flows when discharging groundwater makes up a substantial component of total stream flow. This is Glenn. I'm going to uh, take over this part of the presentation, uh, talking about the historical summer base flow and storm flow trends in, in New England. Just to give you a uh, quick visual and uh, kind of an intuitive uh, definition of base flow being the sustained base level of flow in a stream. Uh, if, we, if we talk about uh, components of total stream flow, uh, people often uh, will put them into bins, what makes up the total stream flow. So this, uh, this slide will go through the kind of a hydrology 101 uh, uh, slide of that. Uh, when, you get, uh, when you get rainfall, obviously it hits uh, the land surface, and if the land surface is saturated or, or frozen, uh, normally uh, happening with intense precipitation. You can get direct runoff quickly into a stream. That's what uh, can make up a large part uh, of the runoff just after uh, large rainfall events. But the rain can also make it into the subsurface zone, the root zone, and that creates a delay in runoff uh, coming into the streams. And the, uh, the rainfall can also make it into the groundwater, into the aquifer, and that can create a substantial delay in runoff coming to the streams. So uh, looking at this a different way, uh, looking at the components of a, just a typical st stream flow hydrograph, the, uh, the surface runoff, the quick runoff, uh, would make up the, the part of the hydrograph shaded in black that you can see. The uh, delayed runoff from subsurface runoff in the soil zone, uh, called interflow by many people, uh, would make up a more delayed contribution to the total stream flow. 
and then the uh, groundwater uh, coming back to the stream, discharging into the stream, would also make up part of the streamflow hydrograph, but a different part, as you can see. Now, the methods that we're using uh, for this study to look at base flow and look at base flow changes over time, it's not possible to differentiate between the subsurface runoff, the delayed surface runoff, which might come from uh, lakes and wetlands, uh, from, the, from the groundwater runoff. And to go through what happens in a, in a typical year in northern New England, uh, in your winter months and in your, your spring months, you, you typically have a snowmelt runoff that, that runoff often combined with rainfall recharges groundwater and surface storage. And again, typically in the summer, uh, when flows are, are lower and you don't have as much recharge, you're getting discharge from those uh, sources of storage, such as, such as groundwater and, and surface water, such as the lakes and wetlands and such. And as, as Rob mentioned, because of the, the changes that we've seen over time, in the timing of the spring snowmelt runoff, uh, we thought that could impact, potentially impact, the magnitude of uh, summer base flows. And the reason that could happen is that if you have a longer recession period, a longer time of recession in the summer, it's possible that you could have uh, lower base flows, you know, just due to the amount of time when you have uh, that uh, recession, it could lead to, potentially lead to lower lower summer base flows. Uh, I, I, would, I would presume that uh, many of the people listening today would be interested uh, in this because of the ecological importance of base flows and stream flows and what any changes that we've seen uh, might mean. Uh, and we're not biologists, but uh, based on our review of the literature, um, we can we can say that relatively cool base flow helps to stabilize summer stream temperatures. It can reduce the influence of high air temperatures, especially over short periods of time. And uh, base flow can also provide cold water refugia in summer. Uh, it, it, it seems to be that the, the cooler water seems to be important for pretty much everything that would be important for fish uh, survival and uh, reproduction, et cetera. And on the other end of things, uh, in terms of the other component of stream flow, uh, that being storm flow, if you get increased storm flow, that could decrease water quality uh, because of combined sewer overflows, which are, which are common in cities in the, the northeastern U.S., and also from non-point source runoff from agricultural fields and things like that. So the objective of this particular study was to uh, see how big historical changes in summer base flows and storm flows have been over time in New England, as far back as we could go, um, based on our historical stream flow data, and then to have a first look at what's behind these changes. And we did that by correlating the interannual variability of base flows and storm flows to potential causal mechanisms, such as precipitation, air temperature, and uh, we also looked into a few other things we won't get into today. And uh, we also looked at uh, snowmelt runoff timing, whether that could be behind, whether that's correlated uh, to the variability of base flows and storm flows. So looking at what we use for data, as we've already mentioned, we use, we use stream flow data, and uh, I'll explain a little bit how we uh, got base flow and storm flow fl from that stream flow data. But we used stream flow data from 25 streams that had data from 1950 to 2006. Ten of those streams also had data from 1930 to 2006, and we analyzed trends in that time period as well. It's very important when you're looking for climatic influences on stream flow to use relatively natural basins. Uh, there's very few basins uh, in the U.S. that are would, could be considered pristine, but you can eliminate uh, obvious things such as stream flow regulation, uh, basins that have undergone substantial land use change, things like that. And uh, we took a lot of time and effort 
to narrow down our stream flow gauges to ones most appropriate to looking at uh, low stream flows. And we also uh, had criteria for low amounts of missing data. In terms of uh, the meteorological data that we looked at, it's also important to uh, use you know, good data, obviously, but uh, data from the, the USHCN network has chosen the best long-term sites in terms of uh, the quality of data from those sites and in terms of minimizing changes over time that you can find, such as changes in the location of weather stations and instrument changes and such. All this is described a lot more in our, in our paper, if people are interested in the details. So what we used uh, to separate base flow and stream flow was uh, an automated method called HISEP, uh, short for hydrograph separation. It's, it's one of several automated methods uh, that you can use. The, the most important thing uh, is to use an automated method so that your comparison over time and between stations is at least consistent. And we discussed in the paper some of the some of the limitations on using this type of method. Here's an example from uh, one stream flow gauge, the Swift River in the western mountains of Maine, and how HICEP divided storm flow from, from base flow for uh, one summer in 1930. So in terms of looking at changes over time, we tested several statistics. One was monthly and summer mean base flows. We looked at mean August base flow, seven day low base flows, uh, summer storm flow, which uh, we mentioned was uh, stream flow minus base flow. And we also looked at base flow, flow ratio, which we, we won't discuss today. That's in the paper. I won't, talk, I won't bore people with a lot of statistical methods, but I uh, just wanted to say it's more, more complicated than, than, uh, it, you may, than you may think it is. Uh, typically, people, when they look for the significance of trust tests over time, have used the Mann-Kendall test, but it's, it's, it's now known that um, you, you can't simplify things that much. The Mann-Kendall test assumes independent data uh, over time, and data can have short-term persistence and it can have long-term persistence, and those things need to be considered, and uh, we did consider them in this article. Um, the magnitude of changes, looking at the magnitude of changes, estimates of the magnitude are not affected by things like long-term persistence, and we'll, we'll give estimates of the magnitude in later slides here. Uh, we've used low S smooths to look at uh, You've already seen some of them, and you'll see some more. That is actually slightly different than the low SEC that has the W in it, but I'm not going to get into that. And the trends you'll see were based on the send slope, which is a very robust measure of changes over time. So here's an example of the data. This is summer seven-day low base flow. So for each year, we took the, the lowest the, the seven days that had the lowest average base flow, and we calculated that for every year. And this is a plot of those over time. Uh, the vertical axis is, is the magnitude of the base flow, and the horizontal axis is, is the, the year. So you can see in this case that uh, there's a lot of variability from year to year. That's the case with, uh, with most of the things that we work with. And the, the black line that you see there is the send slope estimate of changes over time. Uh, which you can compute as a percent change, and, and that's what uh, we're going to present results as here. One thing that's interesting on this plot is you can see in the 1960s, a period known for drought in New England, you can see that there were several years that had very low uh, seven-day low base flows for this river in Vermont. Here's another example of a, of a different statistic, August mean base flows on a different river, the Saka River, and and it comes out of the, the mountains in New Hampshire, northern New Hampshire. And again, lots of variability from year to year. And overall, you see increases over time based on the send slope. And you can see that visually, too, with the points, even given the large amount of variability. Here's a map of results of changes over time in August mean base flows. 
uh, from 1950 to 2006. The blue triangles represent increases over time. The red triangles represent decreases over time. The largest triangles uh, are changes greater than 50 percent. The medium-sized triangles are 20 to 50 percent changes, and the small triangles are 5 to 20 percent changes. You can see in western New England, particularly in Vermont and New Hampshire, you have large changes over time, large increases in August mean base flows, many of them uh, 20 to 50 and greater than 50 percent. And interestingly, in eastern and northern Maine, you have multiple sites with decreasing base flows in August. And uh, using the, uh, the same symbols, by looking at seven-day low base flows, changes over time from 1950 to 2006, uh, again, you see increases over time in the lowest base flows in New Hampshire and Vermont, and you see decreases over time in uh, parts of Maine. Looking at the, the other part of the hydrograph, the storm flows, summer storm flows, uh, summer, uh, if I didn't mention it before, was defined from, for our purposes, from June through September. You can see really large increases over time in uh, in the, the summer uh, summer storm flows in western New England, not so much in uh, northern Maine. Those uh, those large triangles are greater than 50% changes at many different uh, streams, western New England. So getting into what may be behind this, this is summer precipitation for that same time period. And you can see uh, throughout New England increases over time in summer rainfall, um, more so, excuse me, more so in uh, western New England. You can see they're a little bigger. In, in Maine, you can see in places where there are either slight decreases or, or not a significant change indicated by uh, the black circle. So in terms of uh, reasons for the base flow changes over time, uh, it seems to be driven by precipitation increases over time in New Hampshire and Vermont. And the, de the decreases that you see in parts of Maine, uh, what's behind that? Well, it may be due to increased evapotranspiration. And it turns out that air temperatures have increased by about a degree C in uh, New England during the same time period. So uh, increased air temperature would lead to uh, increased evapotranspiration and could be behind uh, some of the decreases in base flows. Interestingly, you know, one of our original hypotheses uh, were summer base flows related to snow melt runoff timing, and the answer seems to be a pretty clear no, they're not. There was uh, very little correlation between uh, summer base flows and the timing of snow melt runoff. I'm going to turn uh, the presentation back over to Rob now to continue on with watershed modeling. All right, thanks. Um, we've received a couple questions, and uh, I think what we'll do is just hold off until the end here um, in, in the off chance that maybe your question will be answered uh, by what we present. And, um, and if not, we're very happy to talk about it at the end. Uh, to take a look at, to, to estimate climate-related changes in the future for uh, hydrology for coastal basins in Maine, we built four watershed models and calibrated them. And these watersheds are home to various anadromous fish species, including Atlantic salmon, the Pleasant, Narragagas, Sheepscot, and Royal Rivers. And we built these models using the USGS's precipitation runoff modeling system, PRMS. And it's a distributed parameter model that simulates rainfall runoff processes as affected by various characteristics of the basin. And uh, explicit modeling of stream flow and the other components of the rainfall runoff process using a model like this uh, is useful to support water quality calculations, fish population, survival migration modeling, and uh, scenario testing like changes in land use, water use, uh, flow management, and 
climate change. So, so very uh, briefly, what I mean by uh, distributed parameter model can be illustrated here. Uh, while the effects of basin characteristics on rainfall runoff processes can sometimes be lumped very simply, especially where hand calculations are being done, a distributed parameter model defines basin characteristics in a more spatially explicit way. And so it breaks down the basin into more homogeneous sub-basins uh, and characterizing the total basin response as the sum of those distributed components. And the sub-basin characteristics are derived from data describing things like elevation, slope, aspect, soil types, and land cover. And the characteristics are then translated into model parameters and the equations governing the various run rainfall runoff processes. So this is what the four basins look like broken down into their component computational sub-basins called model response units, or MRUs. And the MRUs each represent largely homogeneous spatial units uh, with similar basin characteristics. And these are the rain rainfall runoff processes that the PRMS model aims to simulate computationally. And essentially, the water cycle components, including precipitation, evaporation, and uh, along with the various runoff processes, including overland and groundwater flow and storage. And so here's what the process looks like is represented as a computational schematic for PRMS. Precipitation and air temperatures are inputs to the system as well as for the model itself and solar radiation is also uh, an input to the system. Uh, that's data that we don't have and so but that can be estimated as a function of your input air temperatures and precipitation, time of year, latitude, and slope and aspect of your topography of your different model response units. The various components of water moving out of the system compose the total stream flow and include surface runoff, interflow, and groundwater. And evaporation, transpiration, and sublimation and uh, our other avenues for water to leave the system as well as groundwater sink for groundwater that might leave the basin through other ways other than stream flow. And these outflow components contribute to the total stream flow at different time scales, which uh, Glenn has illustrated a little bit earlier. So along those lines, those components making up the total stream flow measured by the hydrograph, and the timing quantities of the runoff described by each of these components affects the final shape of the hydrograph, and that's basically how calibration is done. So the calibration involves uh, iteratively adjusting governing parameters to most closely match the shapes of the observed hydrograph given your input meteorological information. So input data describe daily precipitation and daily minimum and maximum air temperatures. And in the end, you've got a ca calibrated model which provides quantitative time series of the flow components, here showing storm runoff, interflow, and groundwater broken apart. Um, PRMS outputs uh, dozens of various parameters, uh, parts of the rainfall runoff system uh, as an example, you can extract spatially distributed quantities for things like uh, this graphic showing uh, snowpack water equivalent distributed by model response unit. Uh, for example, north or south facing slopes would have greater or lesser amounts of snowpack at a certain time in the spring, and that's explicitly modeled. So with the calibrated models in hand, we proceeded to model a range of climate change scenarios using output from several general circulation models, or GCMs, and simulate the response of the Earth's climate to major driving forces like greenhouse gases. And the GCMs were run by members of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPPC, IPCC and uh, 
due to the uncertainties associated with these different GCMs, for example, uh, differences in feedback mechanisms or just or spatial resolution or time step at which they run. Uh, we're using the output from several GCMs to have an ensemble of GCMs that we use as input to our watershed models. And briefly, uh, I want to acknowledge the help of USGS Modeling Watershed Systems Research Group in Denver uh, for assistance with this uh, climate modeling. And it's the same modeling approach that they use in a climate change study for 14 watersheds across the U.S. And the reference for that is, is at the bottom of this slide. And you should also find it on that uh, climate page that we pointed you to in the beginning of the talk as well. Now, for each GCM, a range of future emission scenarios were run to describe how uh, greenhouse gas emissions might evolve over the next century on the basis of assumptions, including things like population growth, technological changes and economic development, so on, for the world. And so we selected four scenarios from each of the five GCMs that were used to basically cover a representative range of scenarios where uh, relatively low greenhouse gas emissions, scenario B1, high emissions A2, and a middle of the road being A1B scenario. So the GCM and scenario output were applied to the watershed models using a downscaling scheme. The GCMs running on spatial scales of more than a degree latitude, longitude, size grids, and here, and then we're scaling down to a watershed scale, down to those model response units, which could be, you know, on the order of a square mile or so. So we used a simple change field downscaling method in which the change in the future meteorological conditions were computed on a monthly basis between the current condition scenario on the previous slide and the other three future condition scenarios. And those changes in meteorological input data were applied to a 12-year historical input data set and applied in a moving window fashion over time. So each day in the future ends up having 180 different realizations of daily meteorological input to the model representing an ensemble of climate conditions and GCMs. Again, this is explained in detail in, the, in that uh, pop that I pointed to. Here's a time series plot showing overall changes in precipitation over time. This is, uh, again, precipitation and air temperatures are inputs to the watershed models. So the, this is mean daily precipitation includes many days of no precipitation in the calculation, so hence the relatively small numbers on the y-axis. But uh, if you look at the change against the vertical axis, we're talking about perhaps an overall 10% increase in precipitation, not much change at all really projected for all three scenarios. If we look at only days for which there's non-zero precipitation, the maximum daily precip uh, provides an indication of the amount of variability that we're inputting into the model over time. And again, if you look at the central tendencies of those plots, um, you look, it's a 10% increase, if that. And for air temperature, here we're looking at maximum air temperature, maximum daily air temperature. Um, and the minimum plot looks essentially the same, so just showing you this. And overall, the variability for temperature input is a lot lower than the precip. The overall change varies from about 1 degree Fahrenheit for the lowest emission scenario to about 3 degrees for the highest. Here are output daily stream flows, which we've been by month for the early part of the century, in this case, year 2020, for the Narraguegas River watershed model. So each box plot represents over 1,600 daily values, and the central tendency of the data represented by the box with a median of that line in the middle of the box. Uh, the highest flows in general are in April, but can occur in March, uh, much like they do 
presently. Lowest flows are in August and September. Mid-century, 2050 indicates higher flows during February and March, lower in the following months from April to July. And later century, 2080, further increases in stream flow are indicated during January through March, and decreased flows for spring months, April, May, and June. And you'll note the lowest flows in August and September don't really change much over the century with the low flows affected largely by summer precipitation, as uh, Glenn presented with the base flow work. Precipitation being the primary driver of those of low flows. And, uh, and that's projected to be sustained or slightly increased, offsetting any increases in evapotranspiration during a low flow period. So the most substantial projected changes are expected to occur during winter. Uh, consistent with what's been historically observed to date. Uh, if we look at monthly mean basin snowpack water equivalent, we can see the progression from early, mid to late century of decreased storage of water in the snowpack. Here I've arranged the months on the x-axis so that the winter uh, season is, is in the middle of the plot. It appears the greatest changes can be expected to occur in the early part of the century. Dramatic melting of snowpack typically occurs from March to April. So if we focus on these months, we can compare the different scenarios, how they impact monthly mean snowpack water equivalent. The B1 scenario being the lowest emission scenario with the least changes in snowpack, and A2 being the highest and having the greatest uh, with the A1B, again, the middle of the road scenario. So overall, late winter, early spring conditions are expected to, according to these projections, continue to look less like this and more like this over time for the same period of time in the spring. And it's the snow melt, the snow melt process that most commonly contributes to our highest flows, um, which are flood flows, which is of great interest to the transportation departments responsible for designing hydraulic structures capable of handling those flows. Um, so to address those concerns of the main DOT, we were able to leverage the, um, this modeling work to help address their concerns. And uh, we thought that a really brief synopsis of this project would be of interest to the audience uh, because it demonstrates an alternative method for presenting climate-related changes in the future. So I'm hand that over to Glenn. Yeah, it's, it's very, uh, it's very uh, interesting to do this work because it, it took the uh, calibrated uh, models that Rob had used and used them for another purpose. In this case, our uh, State Department of Transportation was interested in uh, how uh, flood flows in the future may change because bridges are designed for uh, 50 to 100 year lifespans, and uh, uh, they're interested to know how potentially uh, climatic changes could, have, could affect future design. So what, uh, what we did with those uh, four rainfall runoff models and those four coastal main basis, basins was to, to generate historical annual daily peak flows. And then with those annual daily peak flows, we compute uh, statistically the 100-year uh, peak flow, also known as the 1% chance peak flow. And we, uh, we compare those to actual historical flows, peak flows, flood flows. And we also generate potential future design flood flows based on expected climatic changes. First of all, it's obviously important to know uh, whether your model is any good at predicting what you're interested in. And in this case, it seemed to be pretty good. Um, we had thought we were going to have to calibrate the model specifically to high flows. But when, when Rob went through that, it turned out uh, we were able to use the calibration that he had done, which calibrated to all flows, low flows, medium flows, high flows. And we did no special calibration for this study in terms of calibrating to the peak flows. And what we found uh, 
was a, did a pretty good job estimating or modeling the two-year peak flow and the hundred-year peak flow based on uh, actual historical estimates. So we compared the modeled estimates to the estimates, the hundred-year estimates and the two-year estimates that we would get from using the historical flow. So what I'm going to do is show you some example output from one of the four basins. They, they both, all four basins had similar patterns of what happened if you change the precipitation or change the temperature. In this case, this is the Narraguegas River in eastern Maine. And uh, what you see here on, the, on this uh, table are changes in the 100-year peak flow if you change temperature or precipitation by set amounts. So in this red box, you can see uh, in this row, what we're doing is we're, we're holding precipitation constant and we're changing temperature in the models. And by, by increasing temperature by a, a 2 degrees Celsius, you can see that, you have, for example, a negative 12% decrease in the 100-year peak flow. And by lowering temperatures, you get an increase of 10% in 100-year peak flows. Now you can look at this uh, the other way. If you hold, uh, if you hold temperature constant, but change the precipitation going into your models uh, here by negative uh, 15% or 15%, as you might expect, as you decrease precipitation, you get decreased uh, flood flows, 100-year flood flows. And as you increase precipitation, you increase the flood flows. So what we've essentially done here is a sensitivity analysis. Rather than directly taking um, modeled scenarios from GCMs and plugging those, downscaling them and plugging them into rainfall runoff models, what we're doing is we're just changing uh, the historical temperature and precipitation by set amounts and seeing what that does to flood flows. Um, but based on based on published studies and work that's Rob that work and work that Rob has done, uh, the the GCMs predict uh, temperatures increasing and precipitation increasing in New England. So we wanted to make sure we included uh, changes in temperature and precipitation that uh, bracketed those potential changes. And uh, so for uh, Again, this is just one river. This is the, the Narragagas River. And you can see if we hold precipitation constant and we increase temperature, you get lower 100-year peak flows. If you hold the temperature constant and increase precipitation, you get increased 100-year peak flows. What's interesting is if you look at what might be considered likely changes by mid-century, uh, temperature increases of, of uh, two degrees or so, and precipitation changes somewhere between zero and 15 percent. The two seem to balance each other in such that you generally get changes plus or minus less than 25 percent to uh, peak flows to flood flows. So why might this be happening? And in particular, why would you get decreased flood flows with increasing air temperature? Uh, it's probably about uh, the reason for it is probably because of changes in snowpack, and this table represents modeled snowpack. Uh, it was explicitly modeled, and you can see that if you increase your air temperatures, you start getting a substantial decrease in the maximum annual snowpack water equivalent. That's the amount of water within the snowpack if you were to melt it. So in summary, uh, how might future floods be, af be affected? Uh, if we have increases in precipitation, you're likely to get increases in uh, large flood flows and small flood flows. Uh, but it's not just, it didn't seem to be a one-to-one -one ratio. They were, the, the increases in flood flows were two to three times greater than uh, precipitation increases. Uh, in terms of increases in air temperature, we got decreased design flood flows, uh, probably due to less snow melt runoff in the late winter and spring. And precipitation increases combined with temperature increases can result in little change in design flood flows. All right, 
Well, that, uh, that wraps up our presentation, and I'm um, not sure if we answered a uh, couple questions that have been asked so far, um, and if not, maybe we can reiterate those questions. Yeah, that sounds, sounds great, Rob and Glenn. Um, if you just want to start, um, I'm going to go ahead and read the questions so we can get them into the audio record, and then we can just have some clarifying remarks from you both. That would be great. Sure. All right, so the first one is from Shaban Rahoni. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, she says, I am, or they are saying, I am wondering if they use daily or monthly stream flow for calculation center of volume date stream, of stream flow. And the answer to that is uh, they were calculated with daily stream flows. Okay, and a follow-up question. If you use daily stream flow, have you considered autocorrelation? How about if they use monthly mean st stream flow? Yeah, auto correlation is important. Um, the way we did it, we created one uh, statistic for each year, so uh, there's only one value within each year. You know, we sum up all the, the daily flows. We look for the date in which half of those flows went by a stream flow gauging station. So you you have one date for for each year. Where uh, where auto correlation comes in is if you're looking be between years, is it possible that the uh, the correlation between years, the autocorrelation between years could affect statistical tests, and the answer to that is yes, and that's why it's important uh, to do tests that take into account short-term persistence and also want to take into account uh, long-term persistence, which, which we did and which you can uh, view in uh, probably more detail than you ever wanted to see in our, in our paper, if you care to look. And is that the um, the website underneath your contact information? Yes. Yeah, and specifically that that re I was referring to the uh, trends in base flow and storm flow in New England paper. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I did want to mention that uh, encourage people to email or call us too. I'd be very happy to talk with you with anybody about any of this. Um. And uh, we we put the the link to all of our. Uh, journal articles and reports up there, again, if anybody uh, is interested. In, and all of the USGS reports that that refers to are available online. Uh, and if you don't have access to the journal articles that that refers to, uh, just let us know. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have another text question, and it says, um, what might cause larger variabil variability of s summer stream flow over time? Now, I saw this question pop up during the um, discussion about base flows, and so I wasn't sure if they're referring to the, the maps where we showed increases in base flows or low flows over time. If that's what's being referred to. I'm not sure about what the what's meant by the variability in the summer I think flows. That, I think that may refer to uh, trends in the magnitude of summer stream flows. Uh, what, what, right. yeah, right. uh, she says, or they say yes, um, and she also, or he also, I'm sorry, Umi, um, in summary, no climate change impact on flood design in Maine based on four watersheds in Maine. Not sure if this is the conclusion from the last page. Um, could you go up one slide there, Ralph? Sure. Wait, is this the page that uh, Umi refers to here? Umi, if you'd like to press star six, uh, she says, or they say yes. Um, what we're saying there, uh, you know, if, if you look at if you look at the uh, changes in precipitation and temperature that are currently projected to be happening as we move forward in New England, it would be an increase in air temperature and an increase in precipitation. And what we're saying there is, for many combinations where you where you both increase precipitation and you increase temperature, the the two work against each other in terms of the magnitude 
of large flood flows so that we actually see, in general, we see decreases if you increase the air temperature due to the, uh, probably due to the lower snowpack. And we see, if you, if you increase precipitation, you see increases. So the, the two often cancel each other out depending on the particular uh, amount that you change precipitation or air, air temperature. Not in all cases, of course. It depends which ones actually occur in, in, the, in the future. And if, say, uh, precipitation increases by more than is currently projected and air temperature increases less, just, just as a, an example, uh, you know, you would, you would look on those tables and see, well, for that combination, what happens? Uh, they may not cancel each other out. They may lean in one direction or another. What we like about doing the sensitivity type of analyses as new projections come out, you can you can see what is expected for changes in air temperature and precipitation, and look in the tables and see at least for these four coastal main sites what that might mean uh, for changes in flood flows. Umi says thank you. All right, we have another text chat question um, from Rachel Muir, and she says, any efforts underway to look at nutrient fluxes for these systems, for example, dissolved carbon, and how they might match up with trends regarding flow? Tom Huntington is actually yeah. working on uh, trends into the, the Gulf of Maine from uh, nutrients and uh, some other things. Um, so yes, there is. That hasn't been published yet. That's in the review process. Okay. And another question from Daryl Van Dyke. And it says, the particulars about your synthetic climate years are in the paper, but in general, your procedure was to perturb prior records by factors statistically derived from GCM scenarios. Do you feel yeah. like this accurately captures changing temporal patterns in precipitation distributions? Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, uh, and you're exactly right. And so that is one limitation of the approach that was used is that um, we're not changing the, uh, you know, the, the spacing between storms, the frequency of storms. Uh, whatever happened in the historical record happens again <laughs> for those future years only with, uh, that's right, perturbations supplied to the air temperature and precipitation. And just to point out that uh, while that's a rather simplistic approach to do any other approach, you'd have to make quite a few more assumptions as to what will actually occur in the future in terms of spacing of storms and such. Okay, thank you. And I just want to remind everybody if they have um, a question, they can use the raise hand icon that's located between the participant list and the chat box. Or, of course, you can use the chat box, as you all have been doing. And Daryl wrote, thank you. Do we have any more questions? All right, Umi has a uh, couple more questions, but she's just going to um, email you, Glenn and Rob. Sounds good. Or they say thank you again. Yep. Okay. Uh, Richard Palmer, you can ask your question. Um, just press star six to take off the global mute. And make sure your own phone is unmuted as well. Thank you very much. As, uh, first, thank you for that great presentation. That was really, really interesting. Um, my, my question revolves around a slide that I don't really remember precisely what it said, but I believe that when you tried to uh, calibrate or to look at the, the degree to which your model was calibrated uh, for the 100-year floods, at least in one case it was off by something like 30 percent, and maybe I, maybe I misread that. I was just wondering if you would comment on the sort of I, cascading uncertainty that occurs between the precipitation and the stream flow, and then the, the estimations, and and whether or not you really that you, that you you feel like the numbers that you arrive at at the end are are pretty firm. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, let me let me try and answer here. And uh, if I, if I don't answer your question, please uh, please ask uh, again. Um, yes, you're correct on one of those on the sheepskin basin. You can see that the the hundred year peak flow was was off by 36 percent, uh, which you know it's not ideal. Um, but one thing to point out is that uh, even though it's off by that amount, uh, what we're doing is we're comparing the historical modeled. Uh, 100-year flow or two-year flow to the historical modeled flows when we uh, perturbate the uh, air temperature and precipitation. So even though it didn't calibrate perfectly, um, whatever bias is built in there is being carried forward. I mean, and certainly when you're when you're trying to model something as, as complicated as flood flows, um, you introduce uncertainties uh, when you have. GCMs, you're introducing uncertainties. You know, yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of cascading uncertainties when you when you do modeling work. Um, where we're doing a more of a sensitivity type of analysis, we're not uh, completely dependent on what current GCMs are are saying, are are, are projecting for the future for changes. Did did, I, did we cover the question, or is there, is there more that? You, or a different uh, angle you'd like us to try to answer? Um, I, I may have misunderstood the the slide, so I just want to make sure that the 36% uh, is the difference in peak flows between what was recorded and what was estimated with historical data. Is that correct? It's the difference between uh, what was modeled, uh, and the models are based on essentially temp historical temperature and precipitation data, not, uh, not on stream flows. But they're then compared to historical stream flows, and not only okay. compared to historical stream flows, but compared to historical daily uh, maximum stream flows, the, the highest da the highest daily average stream flow in any particular year, and then those are put into uh, Bulletin 17B statistical model to compute the uh, the 100-year flow and the two-year flow and such. So one thing that could be happening, you know, you can see there where the the two-year peak flows are modeled quite well, so perhaps what's happening is that the model isn't capturing the skew of the population all that well for that one site uh, over over time. Great, thanks for spending the time on that. Thank you. All right. Are there any last questions? All right, Glenn, Rob, did you have any closing remarks? Uh, just that we, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to present this to, to everyone that attended. And, uh, and again, if you have more questions or would like to talk with us more about it, uh, our contact information, our emails, email and call us. And perhaps uh, some details might be in the, uh, in the reports and, and articles that we didn't state today as well. Excellent. And then Holly or Emily, did you have any closing remarks? No, just a big thank you to both um, Rob and Glenn. That was a great presentation, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. And thanks to everyone else for attending as well.